Welcome to church today. For those of you who are online and in person, I want to ask you to do something. Um, take your phone out. If you haven't done it yet, go ahead and do it now and scan the QR code in front of you. I want to tell you about the top three things happening at Kingwood this week. Uh, so number one on the list is Easter. Everybody realize we have Easter coming? Everybody knows that, right? It's not going to catch you off guard. It's early. I know it's early this year, but I don't want to catch you off guard. Easter is just in two weeks now, and everything you need to know about Easter is there, uh, including a way to invite your friends, family, co-workers, somebody that you know. We're going to have an incredible Easter service, two services on Easter Sunday, and we'd love for you to invite someone. And so you can do that uh, digitally. If you're online or in the room, you can scan the QR code. You can find a, a digital invite. Also, if you're here on campus, um, we have these invites in the foyer. And uh, all you have to do is grab some of these on your way out. And there's a QR code there on the card. So whoever you invite, they can just scan that. And it'll tell them uh, about all the things happening at Kingwood on Easter weekend. Good Friday service, two Sunday morning services, what we're uh, having for kids that day. But here's the, here's the big deal, okay? For all of us that call Kingwood home, um, I want you to look at number two on the top three because um, that gives you an opportunity to tell us the name of the person you're inviting because we want to pray for them with you. How many of you believe prayer changes things? Do you believe that? Come on, lift your hand up. Do you believe prayer changes things? All right. Well, what I'm asking you to do is just give us your name, and then in the blank below, give us a name or as many names as you, of the people you're inviting, and let's pray, and let's ask God to do a miracle. Do you believe he still does miracles? I do. Come on, do you believe that? I believe that. So... Give us that name before you leave campus today and let us pray with you. Our prayer team has these names in their hand and they are praying for them every day between now and Easter. So if you want someone to join you in that prayer time and over that person's life, let us know who they are. Because I believe this Easter, God's going to change people's lives. Do you think resurrection still matters? He's still bringing things back from the dead. And so I can't wait to see what's going to happen this Easter. Well, today we're continuing our series we're just calling Following Jesus. And uh, I've been amazed. I'm sure you've noticed this. This word, um, followers, following, has caught fire in our day. Uh, you know, everybody wants to have followers on social media, right? Whether you're TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, what, whatever your flavor is, everybody wants to build as many followers as they can or friends you know, what, whatever, whatever they call them, you know, people you never met that, you know, ask you, I get, I get them from other countries, you know, like, I don't know who this is, but you have all these people that want a friend or, or people that you're following. Everybody wants their YouTube channel to um, build a mass of followers, people who offer book deals, publishers that offer book deals. Here's the first thing they want to know when they offer you a book deal. They don't care if the content you have is good. They want to know how many followers do you have? Because when you release a book, that's going to tell us how many books are going to sell. So uh, platform building is here to stay. Everything in our culture today seems to be built upon, you know, how many followers a person has. Here's what's interesting, though. This is not a new concept. It's actually an ancient concept in many ways, this idea of following. Uh, you see it all through the New Testament, where Jesus invited people to follow him. And that's what this series has been about. Uh, it is about is what does it look like for you and I to follow Jesus? Now, this is important because it's the entire reason that God made the church. God made the church to make followers of Jesus. That's the whole thing. So I want you to look at this quote by C.S. Lewis. He said it like this, the church exists for nothing else but to draw people into Christ to make them little Christ. If they are not doing that, all the cathedrals, clergy, missions, sermons, even the Bible itself are simply a waste of time. God became human for no other purpose. So this is a big deal. This idea of following Jesus is not just a big deal. It's the big deal in the church, in the kingdom, in your spiritual life. So the goal of every believer 
is to follow Jesus. The goal of every church is to make followers of Jesus. So as we move our way into Easter, we're talking about what does it look like to follow Jesus. And last week we said this. It basically looks like an invitation. So we've looked at um, Jesus' life with the people that he encountered while he was on earth. And we've basically broken down this idea of following Jesus into three invitations. And so we've, we've shrunk a whole lot of life down into three big things, three big uh, progressive invitations, as we've called it. Some of these invitations are easy. They require very little. Some of these invitations are very challenging, and they require a lot. And so last week, we said the first invitation that Jesus gives to all of us is this, come and see. In other words, come check it out for yourself. Uh, come and, uh, when Jesus was on earth, he often invited people or his followers invited people, you know, come listen to Jesus' teaching. Come, come experience the kind of community that he's trying to build. Come and hang out and see uh, what Jesus is doing. Come and ask questions. If you have questions, come and ask questions. So it's very much this kind of invitation of God to say, come check it out for yourself. You don't have to take anybody's word for it. Now, that's not the invitation to salvation. That's not the moment where our relationship begins. That's the moment where Jesus says, hey, look, you don't have any hoops to jump through. It costs you nothing. Just come check it out. Which brings us to the second invitation that we're going to look at today. And that's this. Follow me. So beyond check it out, after check it out for yourself, is follow me. This is the invitation that we get from Jesus to receive forgiveness, salvation, be a part of his family, to follow Jesus for the rest of our lives. And what I want to do this morning is I want to give you three thoughts about this invitation. Here it is. Number one, Jesus' invitation to follow him is challenging. Jesus never invites us to go to heaven. Jesus invites us to follow him. Now that little shift might sound small, but it makes a big difference in the way that we live our life. So the invitation to follow Jesus is the invitation to accept the requirements of a life of faithful obedience to him so that we might understand what true life really is. And there's these powerful moments that you can see in the life of Jesus when he physically walked on the earth, powerful moments of decision where people were hanging around with him, kind of traveling with his crowd, showing up at the events that Jesus was at. But then there came this moment, this pivotal moment, where Jesus would turn to one of them or many of them and say, follow me. And that's the crossroads. That's the point of decision. Now, everybody knows what it feels like to make a big decision. How many of you have ever been snow skiing? Have you ever been snow skiing? If you've ever um, ridden the ski lift to the top of a mountain with these you know, bed rails on your feet, and the higher you go, the more you begin to look out over the mountain and see other mountain peaks, and you say, you know, humans weren't made to be this high. This is not... This is not right. And then you go to the black diamond, you know, just because you're insane. You go to the black diamond, if you know what that is, that's the really extreme, and you look over the cliff. There's this moment of decision where you say, I mean, there's no way down. <laughs> I guess I, I'm here now. And that one little nudge just pushes you over the edge and once you go over the side, there's no way back. So everybody knows what it feels like to make a big decision. Maybe if you've bought your first house. I remember when I bought my first house. I was like, I never, I never been in debt like this before. I never owned a house before. I didn't know how to fix the air conditioner when it broke or, the, or whatever. Like, and then you go to the little table where you, you know, sign in your life away, your children away, your grandchildren, everything you have, paperwork, you know, you're just signing paper after it. Oh, trust me, this is what it says, this is what it says. And you see, you know, like six font, you know what I'm saying? You need a magnifying glass to read it, and you get this feeling, this uneasy feeling like, do I really know what I got myself into? Or, or maybe, um, 
You had to have some kind of surgery. It's irreversible. And you're laying there in the surgical prep room, and you go, okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm here. And they put the little gas mask over you and knock you out, and you go, no way back now. Like that's, like that's a big decision. Or if you've ever stood at an altar with your fiance, and the pastor looked at you and said, do you promise to keep yourself to this person to love, to serve, to cherish, and for better or for worse, till death do you part. Whew. Yes. <laughs> right? So we all know what it's like to make a big decision. Can I tell you this invitation from Jesus to follow him? It's challenging. It's a big step. We may have an Americanized it, and we may have uh, consumerized it a little bit, and we might have made it this small little thing. It's a big, challenging step, and you can see that the first four disciples that Jesus invited to follow him, they had been out fishing all night, and they weren't catching anything. And then Jesus shows up on the scene, and he says, throw the net on the other side of the boat, and they do. And all of a sudden, they have more fish than they know what to do with, you know, almost sinks the boat, and they come to the shore. And here's the thing, watch this. When they come to the shore, do you know what Jesus said? Follow me. Look at uh, Luke 5, 11. As soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. You know what's interesting? That um, oftentimes, before God invites you to follow him, he reveals his goodness to you. He says, hey, you're having trouble with that? Let me show you something. Let me show you something about my character. Let me show you something about who I am. Let me show you something about the kingdom. God is good. And he reveals that to us, and we receive that, and we say, wow, I didn't even know. And then he says, follow me. Now, what kind of invitation was this? Luke 5.11 says they left everything. In, the, in uh, Mark's gospel, he said that James and John left their work and their family. They left their father. <laughs> I mean, they left. It's like they dropped the net, walked out of the boat, and that's it. They literally left everything. How big of a commitment is this following Jesus? Now, they already had met Jesus. They knew him. They had come to check it out, but they weren't following him yet. Now, I want you to think about that decision for a minute. They didn't know where it would lead. They didn't understand how difficult it would be. And they didn't know that Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection was still ahead of them. When you say yes to Jesus, you make the decision to follow him. And so what does that mean when you say yes to Jesus? It means that you're deciding, you're taking a big step and saying, Jesus, I'm going to follow you, which means you're also saying, I'm not going to follow me anymore. I'm going to follow you. You know, oftentimes when life gets hard, we say, Jesus, take the wheel. <laughs> you know, here, you drive. But what about when life's going the way we want it? No, 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 give me the wheel. I want to drive. The decision to follow Jesus is challenging because it says... Whether life is going the way that I want it to or not, you drive. You make the decisions for my life. I want to follow you. Now, this is a radical countercultural message because our culture does everything it can do to develop our entire lives around our own desires. So oftentimes we build our entire identity around our accomplishments or our social status or the platform that we're building, trying to get rich, education. Some people build their identity around their looks, around their children, around sports, around sexuality, around addiction, around pain. We center our lives around these things and our lives revolve around these things. And the messages that we hear in our culture is be your best self, find your truth, follow your heart. And Jesus says, don't do any of that, follow me. That is a counter-cultural message. 
Jesus' invitation is challenging, but let me tell you this. Following Jesus has been harder than I ever thought it would have been, but it's been better than I ever imagined. But it's not easy. It's okay to clap for that. That's okay. That's good. Number two, Jesus' invitation to follow him is personal. You know this. Everybody in the room and watching online, you already know what I'm about to say. Not every story ends like the four disciples. Not everybody says yes to Jesus. Everybody is invited by Jesus, but not everybody says yes. The Bible even says, narrow is the way, and few people find it. And just like today, there were people who Jesus invited when he walked the earth, and they said no. One was a um, young, successful, rich man, and he came to Jesus, and he said, what, what do I have to do to get eternal life? I think his perspective was kind of like, I've already got everything else. Like, I've kind of made it. I've kind of arrived. Young, successful. He probably had a convertible. You know, he was good. He was locked in. Had his stock options. Now he, now he started to think about eternity. I've got all this. What do I need to do to nail, nail down eternity? I mean, I keep the Ten Commandments, he said. I'm a, I'm a good person. He was moral. And Jesus' answer to him is so amazing because Jesus knew his heart and Jesus challenged him and he said, here's what you need to do. I want you to give away everything you own to the poor and come follow me. And he said, no. And he walked away. Now that's interesting because it makes us think, is that what it means to be a real Christian? Is that what each one of us need to do? Do all of us need to give away everything that we own to the poor in order to be a real Christian or a true Christian? No. Because we see other examples of wealthy people in the Bible. We have Abraham and King David and Job was rich and then poor and then rich. <laughs> and, then, and then King Solomon. And, and God never asked them to give away what they had in order to really follow him. So this man's case, in this man's case, wealth was his first love and Jesus knew it. And so Jesus knew that this man was a proud man. And he had accomplished a lot, really young. He was young and successful. And so Jesus, Jesus knew he, he was proud of his accomplishments. And he knew that he would never be the king of his heart as long as those other things were the king of his heart. And so Jesus reached in and challenged him at the exact spot that he needed to be challenged. Jesus gave him a heart test. We have another example Jesus called a different man that didn't follow him. Luke 9, 59 and 60 says this. He said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Now, this passage has a lot of nuances to it. We don't have time to address fully today. But let's just try to summarize it like this. His father had not already died. This is a way for this man to say, Hey, I want to follow you, but not now. I'm too busy. I've got other things to do. I, I don't, I'll follow you later. I don't have the time now. So this first guy loved success. The second guy was too busy. But here's the, story, here's the point of the story. Jesus knows what dominates our hearts, and he personalizes his invitation to each one of us. We see this throughout the New Testament. When Jesus is inviting crowds of people to follow him, he gives the general requirements of salvation. He gives the general invitation of being a disciple. But when he speaks to individuals, he always gives very specific requirements, and they're different from person to person to person. Jesus always knew how to get to the root of a person's disbelief and how to, and how to touch 
what was actually preventing them from following them, whether it was doubt or comfort or money or family or anything else. Here's the thing. Jesus knows what is in your heart, and he knows what hinders you, and there's going to come a day he's going to touch it. And he's going to say, follow me. Leave this behind and follow me. Why? Because following Jesus, fully following Jesus, is the only hope any of us have to ever be free and to be whole. We have no other hope. So Jesus loves you, and he knows you, and he will speak directly to you. And he will speak to you in such a way that will bring you to a point of true decision. I remember when Jesus did this in my life. My heart was filled with emptiness. I was a teenager. I had no purpose. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't know where I was going. I was just sort of floating in life. I had a lot of dysfunction and brokenness in my family. And this emptiness that I was trying to figure out one night, late one night in my living room, Jesus touched it. And he basically said, now are you going to try to deal with this emptiness by yourself or will you give it to me? Come follow me. And that night, I said yes. And I made a decision to follow him. And I gave him the mysterious inner emptiness that I'd lived with most of my life and didn't know what to do with. I gave him the purposelessness. I gave him the frustration. I gave him the anger. I gave him those things. And I had to give them to him again and again as I walked with him. But this, this whole... Um, Invitation of Jesus does bring up an interesting um, dilemma. And that is, what about the people who, who say no? Well, if saying yes to Jesus puts you in a position to believe and follow him, then saying no to Jesus puts you in a position that you don't believe and you don't follow him. And I want you to imagine for a minute the first four disciples that were in the boat when Jesus said, follow me, if they would have held onto their nets and stayed in the boat, they would have never followed him and they would have never been in a position to learn from Jesus in a way that would have transformed their lives. So saying no has real consequences. But what about the people in your life and my life who've said no? Because according to the scripture, that's most people. I want to encourage you today, and I want you to hold out hope for them, because here's what research says. Research says that the people who say no to Jesus over and over and over, when they do finally say yes, they're so much more likely to follow Jesus the rest of their life. But the people that quickly and immediately and easily say yes to Jesus the first time they hear something are so likely to turn away and fall away. So every no may be one more step closer to yes. <laughs> so I want to encourage you not to give up and to keep praying. My son was home this uh, week. It was their spring break. And he brought a whole um, group of friends with him. And uh, one of the guys in the group told me some of his story. Uh, he grew up in a kind of rough little town. And um, he had started following Jesus when he was a young teenager, uh, but his mom was a Christian, his dad was not, and as he became an older teenager, he became so frustrated that his dad, and he started to question God, like, is God even real? Why isn't God doing anything with my dad? His dad was actually part of another, a different religion, and so it was, it was really difficult, and he kept thinking, if God's real, why, why doesn't anything happen? Why does anything change? And so he got so frustrated and angry with God, he, he just... He just walked away and, and took on a life of uh, drug addiction and all kind of stuff. And what's crazy is about the time he threw his hands and gave up and walked away and just jumped off the deep end, his dad came to faith and got baptized. <laughs> and, and, and now, of course, this guy's come back because he's in ministry school. And um, that was five years ago. 
and now the dad's a leader in their church. And so I just want to encourage you, don't give up. Keep praying, keep believing, keep reaching, because just because it's a no today doesn't mean it's a no forever. <laughs> and that no may be one step closer to yes. Jesus' invitation is challenging, and Jesus' invitation is personal. And number three, Jesus invites us many times to follow him. Now, what do I mean by that? I, I, does Jesus invite a person who's not a Christian many times to become a Christian? Yes. But that's not my point here. My point is that our journey of faith is a lifelong journey. And there will be many invitations from Jesus for you to follow him in a new season, in a new time, in a new way, to follow him deeper. And so, and so I want us to consider this morning what that means. These crossroads are inevitable, and they, they are points of decision, and we have to decide again and again and again and again. I can remember in my life when I uh, had one of these, this might not sound very heavy to you, but I was 16 years old, and I'd only walked with the Lord for less than a year. And I can remember when I was driving, I can take you to the highway, I was driving down, and uh, the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said, I want you to give up your best friend. And that was a big deal to me because from the earliest memories of my life, that friend was in my life. And he had been my best friend all my life. And he was a year older than me, but he had never been a believer. And he was going a different direction than I was going. And he wasn't a bad person, but I couldn't stay connected with him and follow Jesus fully and deeply. And I can remember how confusing that was to me. There came this little fork in the road. What am I going to do? Jesus has given me this invitation to say, come on a little deeper. And for you to come deeper, here's what it's going to look like. And those are the kind of invitations that we have throughout our life with Jesus. Jesus' disciples came to an intense crossroad because he had just given an incredibly difficult teaching. It was so difficult, the uh, religious leaders were frustrated and angry at him. In fact, some of Jesus' own followers, the teaching was so hard, they turned away. And look what Jesus said to his disciples. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. And Jesus looked at his 12 disciples, look, do you not want to leave too? Or, or you do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the 12. The 12! These are the apostles. These are the disciples. This is the inner core of the inner core. This is Jesus' small group. These are the people that Jesus had come and poured his entire life into and was going to hand over the reins of the New Testament church. You and I are gathered in a church today because of those 12. And Jesus looked at them and said, do you want to go back? What was that? That was also an invitation to say, do you want to come deeper? That was Jesus' way of saying, what do you want? Do you want to turn away like the other ones did? Or do you want to keep coming deeper with me? Let me ask you a question. This is a gut check time. Let me ask you a question. When did you decide? When did you decide that your faith was not your parents' faith it was not your grandparents' faith. It was not your um, uh, small group leader's faith. It was not your church's faith. It was not a pastor or a leader you looked up to. It was a, not a mentor. It was not a denomination. When did you decide that your faith is your faith? When did you decide that even if this person that I admire and even in this person I respect, even if they turn away, I will not turn away? That's the invitation of Jesus. Follow me. <laughs> Keep following me no matter what. So if you're in this phase of following Jesus, let me give you three quick things that you can do. Okay? This is not the moment of, am I becoming a Christian? But you're anywhere from, I became a Christian today to I've been walking with the Lord. What can you do to follow Jesus? Here's three quick things. Number one, take simple steps. So if you are uh, a new believer or you've been a believer for a little while and you've never been baptized in water, take that step. Jesus was baptized in water. 
You want to follow Jesus? Follow him into the water. (laughs) That's what Jesus did. Because it was a public confession of his faith that I'm crossing this line. I'm identifying with Jesus and I'm identifying with his people. I want to follow Jesus. Take a step of water baptism. You can go to our, our website, go to Next Steps and find out how to sign up. We want to help you with that. Gather with the church. Just like the Holy Spirit came to me when I was a young believer and said, you can't keep all of your old friends and follow me. You need a new community. Can I tell you to follow Jesus? You need a Christian community. And so if you're not in a small group, man, you need to be in a small group. If you're not gathering with the church, you need to be gathering with the church. Because this is where God's this is where God's people gather to follow Jesus and learn how to follow Jesus when we're not together. Start a simple Bible reading plan. If you don't know where to start, go to the book of John and just read, read a chapter a day. Here's the second thing: begin to rethink your life. Here's the thing: when you become, when you start following Jesus, the Bible says you're a new creation. All old things have passed away and all things have become new. You have a new identity. You have a new direction. You, you, have, you have a new purpose. And that means you have to rethink every area of your life. So how, 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 do, how would Jesus do if Jesus were me? I asked myself this time. If Jesus were me, how would he do this? How would Jesus interact in marriage? How would Jesus handle money? How would Jesus handle time? How would Jesus steward his health? How would Jesus reach out? What would Jesus say? What would Jesus not say? How would Jesus post on social media? Come on, somebody! (laughs) Right? What would Jesus do? That's what it means to have a Christ-centered life. It means you, you are reorganizing and restructuring your life around Jesus because he's the center. You're trying to reorient. Here's the third thing. Allow Jesus to remove some things from your life. There's been many things in my life, but the first one I can remember is when Jesus said, this relationship needs to shrink. That's what he said to me when I was less than a year old in faith. And it was overwhelming to me. You know what I've learned? Oftentimes, we can't receive the things that Jesus wants to give us because our hands are so full of everything else. And so following Jesus, responding to his invitation to follow him deeper might mean letting some things go. It might be other loves. It might be other passions. It might be other interests. It might be past wounds. It might be past pains. It might be childhood dysfunction. It might be a lot of things. It might be anger. But we're so full so many times of so many other things, we can't receive what Jesus wants to give us today. So would you stand with me this morning? Our worship team's coming to lead us in uh, one more song. And as they do, I want to ask you to close your eyes for a moment. And I just want to ask you, pray to ask God to help you to hear what is the Holy Spirit saying to you what is he saying to you today Lord I I, I ask you Holy Spirit I ask you to draw us to Jesus today Holy Spirit draw us to Jesus from wherever we are from whenever we're we're watching from whatever we're going through Holy Spirit draw us to Jesus today draw us closer speak to our heart specifically and personally and challenge us and help us to hear what you have to say in Jesus name